I have to tell you a little story before we get started about the last time I preached, last time I was able to share with you. In the first service that morning, I had gone 45 minutes, and I was talking to Mike Tweed afterwards, and Mike was saying, you know where to cut, don't you? Because I'm trying to keep it around 30 minutes. He says, yeah, I had four points, and I overdid it on the first point. He said, so I'll cut off on that first point. He says, yeah, it's a good idea. So after the second service I got done, he come, I met him in the hallway. He says, well, how'd you do second service? I said, 48 and a half minutes. He said, I thought you were going to cut. Well, I did. I cut on the first point, but then I added to the next three, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, we're not going to have that issue today. Um, let's go together uh, to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for giving me the opportunity here to open your word. Thank you for the lessons that we find there, for your spirit that reveals the truth we find. Uh, Lord, may my words today be your words, and not mine, but yours. Lord, change our hearts. Change our hearts, Father. Make our belief truly become an action. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know if you guys have seen that new movie out. It's called uh, Do You Believe? If you haven't seen that movie yet, I highly recommend it. It's an awesome movie. Last Sunday, my wife and I were able to go with my daughter and my son-in-law, and we went to go see it. The, here's just a, a, a general breakdown of the movie. It said a dozen different souls, all moving in different directions, all longing for something more. As their lives unexpectedly intersect, they each are about to discover there is power in the cross of Christ, even if they don't believe it yet. When a local pastor is shaken to the core by the visible faith of an old street corner preacher, he's reminded that true belief always requires action. His response ignites a faith-fueled journey that powerfully impacts everyone it touches in ways that only God could orchestrate. This is that street preacher. And this is what he said in the movie to the, to the pastor. He says, believing, true believing ain't just knowing about it or preaching about it. No, true believing means accepting that Christ carried this cross, was nailed to this cross, died on this cross for you. And if you truly believe that, then I ask you, what are you doing about it? That convicted me to the core, just like it did the pastor, it convicted me. I was wondering if I got put on trial, would, I, would there be enough evidence against me that I would be convicted as a Christian? You see, I think that's what James was talking about in the second chapter when he was talking about faith, when he was talking about works. If we truly believe in the cross of Christ, if we truly believe that there's power and victory in the cross of Christ, what are we doing about it as a church? What am I doing about it? I want to share something with you. I was talking to my wife this week about, I was asking her, how could I be a better teacher from the pulpit? How could I be a better preacher? And she's told me that sometimes I get up here and I walk back and forth behind this pulpit and I preach to you guys like I've got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. And when I'm, what I want to talk to you about today, what am I doing about my faith? I don't have that figured out either. You could probably wrap this whole lesson up with one word. Love. You see, James wrote in the second chapter, starting with verse 14, says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says, to them, oh, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you don't give them what their body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. You see, belief, it's not enough just to believe. Continues on, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, you believe that God is one, you do well, but the demons also believe and they tremble. You see, it's not enough to believe. Belief on the, I want you to picture a tree, the faith tree, right? Belief is what would be the roots of that tree, the roots that hold it in the ground. You see, but the faith comes up and the, and the, the fruit that grows on that tree, that's the works that, Paul's, or that James is talking about right here. You see, because if we don't truly have faith, we won't have fruit right? 
if I was going to go to trial, be put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? And I don't know. I can't answer that question. I think it's a question that we all have to, we all have to answer for ourselves. You see, in the Old Testament, they had 630 plus laws that they were told to keep. But when Jesus came, when Jesus was born, he said, I came to fulfill that. In Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. Okay? He took all of that away. No more did we have 633 laws. He basically gave us one. One commandment is all he gave us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbors as you love yourself and love your enemies. One law, love, with three applications. He didn't complicate it. He actually simplified it. But how difficult is that for us to do? How difficult is that for me to do? And sometimes it's hugely difficult. You know, you might have a person at the office, in your office, that just irritates the daylights out of you, that you would look at that person and say, Lord, I cannot love that person. God's calling us to do that very thing. Maybe you have a neighbor that just irritates the daylights out of you, and, and he just makes it so he, he's unlovable, or she's unlovable, or they're unlovable. Well, we're called to do, we're called to love. You see, Jesus was the best teacher, and he taught his disciples service. In the 13th chapter of John, the scene unfolds. They're preparing for the Passover meal. Jesus takes off his robe, his rabbi robe, and he lays it outside. He takes a towel and he puts it around his waist, and he gets a wash basin and he fills it up full of water, and he kneels down before his disciples and he starts to wash their feet. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I'm, going, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will know. You will never wash my feet ever, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Oh, and then Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. You see, when Jesus had washed their feet and put, on, and put his rabbi robe back on, he reclined again and he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and you call me Lord. This is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. And he sums it up in the 34th verse of the 13th chapter. He says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Not 633 laws. One. Love one another. Love God. You see, we're not called to be like other Christians. We're called to be like Christ. And Christ gave us that example as he bent down the Savior bent down and washed the feet of his disciples. And he says, this is what you, I want you to do for one another. I want you to love one another. And it's by this love the world will know you're my followers. You see, for the first 300 years of the church, it was persecuted. But do you know why it was persecuted? The church believed that Jesus Christ was king. And consequently, the kings of that age, the kings of the Roman kings and, and so on and so forth, the Caesars, the Neros, they didn't like Christians because they weren't recognizing him as king, because they only recognized Jesus as king. I'm wondering, that town out there, city of Cheyenne, they would look up on that hill and they say, that's that church up there. That's that church. And I don't know, I don't know if you can go and be a part of that group because they just will just love the daylights out of you. They just, they're just too kind. They're just, too, they're just way too devoted to Jesus. 
Wouldn't that be cool? Right? If the world would look at us and say, the only thing that they could come up with that was wrong with us is that we were too devoted to Jesus Christ. And it starts with me. If not me, then who? After I saw this, all week long, the Lord's been hammering on my heart. Who am I calling you, Corey, to love? Will the world find enough evidence in you that I would be convicted as a Christian? You see, faith, the fruit of the faith tree, is action. Belief is an action, and it's time for us to act, right? And I'm not talking about the negative actions because the world has certainly seen enough negative actions from the church, haven't they? You know, the world can see that the church is a cliquish place. The church is an elitist place sometimes. The church is a judgmental group. You know, and I, I have to be honest with you, I, I have suffered all of those things. I found myself being judgmental, being critical, being that I'm saved by the Lord, so that somehow makes me better than somebody else. It doesn't make me better. It just makes me a sinner who is in need of a Savior. I'm not better. I'm just saved. You see, the world sometimes sees the church as a negative place. But what would happen if they saw us and they'd say, gosh, that North Christian church, they just love each other just so darn much. I can't be a part of that because they just, they'll love your socks off. Right? I can't be a part of that because they do that forgiving thing. They, 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 they demonstrate their love for one another by forgiveness, by showing mercy, by showing compassion. I don't want to be one of those guys, right? Very convicted. If we believe, what does it call us to do? What are we doing about it? And I had to ask myself, Corey, what are you doing about it? What am I doing about the love? God's just called me to love, and that's all. You know, because sometimes I can have a whole lot of love, a whole lot of self-love. You know, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Boy, if that was possible, because I, I can really love myself. <laughs> I, can, I can have a whole lot of self-love. And if I loved others as much as I love myself, what a beautiful thing that would be, wouldn't it? Yes, I was convicted. Because my faith... Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is also dead. It's not enough for me to believe, but my belief has to turn to action, and that action should be love. I thank the Lord for that conviction because whether I have a difficult boss who's difficult to love, or I have a person in the cubicle next to me who's difficult to love, or I have the person who cuts me off in the middle of the intersection. <laughs> Honestly, when that happens to me, the first thing that goes through my mind is not love. <laughs> but see, but you see what I'm saying? What if the world out there would say, Corey, he's one of those Jesus freaks. You know, DC Talk, in their, in their, at the end of their song, Jesus Freak, he said that the number one cause for atheism in the world is Christians. Do you believe that? That pay homage to God with their lips and then walk out the church doors arm in arm with the world. Mahatma Gandhi was asked, what's the only thing that would keep Christianity from taking over India? You know what his answer was? Christians. That was very eye-opening when I read that. Because really, like the early church, they should look at us and say, they've got a love, they've got a compassion like none other, and I want to be a part of that. I want the church of today to be so irresistible because they look at us and they say, wow, 
They really know how to love one another. Wow, they're really dedicated to Jesus Christ. Wow, they say that Jesus is their Lord. Not only do they say it, but look at the way they live their lives. Yeah, I can convict Corey Falzone for being a Christian because I see enough evidence in his life by the way he lives it that I can convict him of being a Christian because there's no doubt. That's what I want. You see, that world out there is starving for the love and the compassion that Jesus Christ has. If you're saved, you know what that means. You, you, you've come in contact with the grace of Jesus Christ. You come into contact with the supreme forgiveness that washed all of your sins away as far as the east is from the west. You know already. And you know that dark, that evil world out there is starving for, to know that love and that compassion. How are they going to know that, you ask? Well, it's the preacher's job, or it's the elder's job, or, no, it's your job. That's my job, isn't it? How's the world going to know that love and that compassion that it's so starving for? It's because I'm going to go and show it. And I've got to be honest with you, I don't do a very good job of that, I don't think. I was hugely convicted. Belief is an action. God said, it's time for you to act, Corey. So, I'm just sharing with you conviction that God had laid on my heart this week. And I don't want to be a conviction hog, so I get to share that conviction with you. You see, God had pierced my heart. Do I love like he's asking me to? I hope and pray for all of us here that God's Spirit continues to work in us and mold us and shape us into the lovers that Jesus called us to be. They will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. And that's what that world out there will find irresistible. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this message and your, your spirit that works in us. I believe that uh, in my heart of heart that belief is an action, and, in, and I believe you're calling me to action. I believe you're calling us as a church to action. Action, and that action is to love. If we truly believe that Jesus died on that cross for us, and we truly believe that we're forgiven, and we truly believe that we have eternal life, Lord, then our lives would demonstrate that. May we be that church up there on the hill next to that water tower that they point at and say, boy, they are Jesus freaks. And I want to be part of that love and part of that family because look at how they love one another. And Lord, I also know it starts with me. Use me, Father, as your mouthpiece. Use me as your, your hands, your arms, your feet. Use me, Lord. To be the shower of that love that this world so starves for. Use us. Use this church. It is time for action, and that action is love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.